In this video, we will explore the differences between physiological and structural support in plants. We will learn some examples of each of these types of support and how they can be beneficial to the survival of a plant. Have you ever noticed that if a pea rolls under the kitchen fridge and then you find it months later, it will have become wrinkled, shrunken and dry. If you tried putting this same pea into a glass of water, it would swell back up to its original size pretty quickly, although eating it at this point would not be a good idea. This shrinking and swelling of the pea is due to its cells losing and gaining water, and it displays one typical example of a method of support in plant cells. While humans, like many animals, have a skeleton to support them, plants do not. Therefore, plants need other support mechanisms to maintain their cell shape and their overall shape, and also to protect them. There are two methods that a plant uses to maintain its shape and structure. Physiological support and structural support. Physiological support is temporary and it depends on maintaining a high volume of water in the plant cells to keep their shape. Structural support, however, is permanent. It involves the deposition of strong polymers into certain cell walls in specific parts of the plant. This maintains the shape of those cells and of the plant as a whole. The pea shrinking and swelling displays an example of a physiological support mechanism and we will look at the support method first. This diagram shows a typical plant cell. Which structures can you recognise in it? We can see the nucleus, some chloroplasts, a rigid structural layer called a cell wall surrounding the outside of the cell, and within it a thinner cell membrane. We can also see a large permanent vacuole which has been shown here in blue. As the nucleus and chloroplasts aren't particularly important to physiological support, let's erase these from our diagram. The vacuole in a plant cell is usually a large structure filled with a liquid called cell sap. Cell sap contains water molecules, which have been shown in our diagram in blue, and dissolved solutes like sugars and enzymes, which have been shown in our vacuole as pink. Lots of water can be stored in this vacuole, and as the volume of water increases, the vacuole exerts more turgor pressure on the cell membrane. Let's have a look at how this happens and why it is important. When plants have little water in the environment surrounding their cells, there is a lower water potential outside the cells than inside the cells. This causes water molecules to move out of the plant cell's vacuole and into the extracellular space through a process called osmosis. You may recall that osmosis is the movement of water molecules from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential across a plasma membrane. This causes the plant cells to eventually wrinkle and shrink, as so much water is lost from the cell's vacuole when it's placed in a low water environment. The low water availability causes the cell membrane to pull away from the cell wall, as there's less turgor pressure exerted upon it by the water in the vacuole. This lowers the cell's turgidity eventually making the cell appear shrunk and wrinkled. When several plant cells shrink in this way, it eventually leads to the plant, especially its leaves, visibly wilting. However, this process is temporary. If the water availability outside the cells increases again, the water can move into the plant cell's vacuole by osmosis from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential, returning the cell to its normal size. But what happens if the water potential continues to increase in the extracellular environment? Well, even more water molecules will move from the extracellular environment into the plant's vacuole by osmosis, from an area of comparatively high water potential to an area of comparatively low water potential. As the vacuole now contains more water molecules, it increases in size even further. And so it exerts far more turgor pressure upon the cell cytoplasm, pushing the cell membrane against the cell wall and increasing the cell's turgidity. This makes the cell appear swollen. You can see the effects of this very high turgidity in many plant cells in the whole plant here. However, as we mentioned, this process is temporary. So if the water availability decreases once more, the plant could still eventually wilt again. Now that we've learned some more information about physiological support in plants, Let's learn about some structural support mechanisms. As we mentioned earlier, structural support involves specific tough compounds being permanently incorporated into a plant cell wall. Different compounds will be deposited into the walls of different cells, depending on their function. 
These compounds can help to maintain the shape of the plant cells and therefore the plant itself, keeping it upright and strong. Plant cell walls are made primarily of a carbohydrate called cellulose. Cellulose fibres build up to form a mesh within plant cell walls. This creates a physical barrier to support the cell. If we were to magnify just one part of one of these cellulose fibres, we would see that it's made up of many cellulose chains, which individually are made up of many monomers of glucose joined together. The fact that each strand of cellulose is made up of thousands of glucose molecules joined together into a chain, which are then joined together into cellulose fibres formed into a mesh, makes cellulose very strong. Cellulose is also described as an insoluble polymer and it can help to maintain cell turgidity in the physiological response that we just looked at. Cells without cell walls, like this typical animal cell, will also absorb a lot of water molecules by osmosis if they're placed in an environment that has a higher water potential than the cell itself. However, without a cell wall, when a typical animal cell gains too much water, the cell will burst. In the same situation, plant cells will just become more swollen and firm as their rigid cell wall prevents them from bursting. Let's take a look at some specific regions in the plant where cellulose cell walls might be useful for other reasons. This diagram is of a leaf. By cutting this leaf in half and magnifying it, we can see certain tissues. And by magnifying it even further, we might be able to see some cells. The cells in a plant's epidermis, which line the top and the bottom of its leaves, as well as other structures like the plant's stem, have cell walls particularly rich in cellulose. Plant leaves have both an upper and a lower epidermis. Especially in the outer tissues of a plant, such as in the epidermis, the cellulose cell walls form a barrier to prevent disease-causing pathogens like those shown here in red from entering the inner tissues. This protection is heightened even more as the epidermis sometimes produces a waxy cuticle to coat it. The cells that make up this cuticle have a polymer called cutin deposited into their cell walls. Cutin is impermeable to water. This prevents the excess loss of water from the surface of the leaves and it helps to prevent waterborne pathogens from settling on the leaf surface. Cutin increases the effectiveness of this physical barrier by thickening the cell walls. Let's take a look at some different cells in this leaf. The cells highlighted in blue in our diagram make up a tissue called the xylem. We can see the magnified structure of part of a xylem vessel here. The xylem is part of the plant's vascular transport system, responsible for transporting water and minerals from the roots to the rest of the plant. The cell walls of xylem vessels contain a polymer called lignin. Lignin is a really strong polymer and it provides additional support to the xylem by making its vessels more rigid and helping them to remain upright to form a continuous column of water. Lignin is impermeable to water, which is really helpful in the xylem as it reduces the chances of water leaking out of the vessels, increasing the efficiency of water transport. Lignin and cellulose can also be incorporated into the cell walls in various other parts of the plant. Let's take a quick look at the typical simple tissue types that might include some of these polymers in their cell walls. There are three main types of simple tissues in plants. Parenchyma tissue, cholenchyma tissue, and sclerenchyma tissue. You may recall that a simple tissue is composed of cells that are structurally and functionally very similar to each other. Parenchyma cells typically have thin cell walls made up of cellulose. They also tend to contain many chloroplasts to carry out photosynthesis. Sclerenchyma cells found in sclerenchyma tissues have thicker cell walls and they're reinforced with lignin and extracellulose. Sclerenchyma cells are generally found in non-growing parts of the plant to add structural support. For example, the walls of the xylem vessels we looked at earlier will be full of sclerenchyma cells. Cholenchyma cell walls are reinforced with extracellulose and sometimes additional substances like pectin to provide extra support, typically in young stems, as cholenchyma is far more flexible than sclerenchyma. Cholenchyma cells also usually contain chloroplasts to carry out photosynthesis. This celery stick provides us with a nice relatable example of where we can find cholenchyma and sclerenchyma tissues. Though the majority of the stalk will be made up of tough sclerenchyma tissues, that make it crunchy and give it a signature snap when we break it. Cholenchyma tissue makes up most of the veins that run down the stalk. These stretchy strands are highly flexible, which shows us a key characteristic of cholenchyma tissue. Let's have a look at a final structural support mechanism in plants. 
Some plants have a cork layer surrounding organs like the stem, as we can see on the cork that's making up part of the bark of this mature tree. Cork is formed by the deposition of a waxy, impermeable substance called suberin into its cell walls. In some cells, like those of a potato tuber shown here, an infection by a pathogen can cause cork to form. If the pathogen manages to make its way past the outer cells of the potato tuber, a cork layer can form as suberin is deposited into the cell walls, protecting the innermost cells from infection. When certain trees begin to lose their leaves in preparation for winter, this forms a vulnerable region through which pathogens might be able to access the plant's inner tissues. But not to worry, as a scar of cork usually forms over this region, forming a protective layer that prevents pathogen entry. As it is impermeable to water and therefore waterproof, cork provides another layer of support both against losing water and against pathogen entry. Plants depend on these support methods for their survival, so let's explore some of the advantages they can provide to plants. Plant support helps plants to conserve water. Conserving water is advantageous to plants as it's a reactant in photosynthesis, which is the biological process by which they make their own nutrition in the form of glucose. Therefore, water is vital to plants for them to be able to make their own food. This glucose can then be used, sometimes along with oxygen, which is also produced in photosynthesis, in a process called cellular respiration, to release energy. Water is also a useful transport medium, among its plentiful other functions. Plant support helps plants to remain upright, which allows them to access more sunlight. Light is another key requirement for photosynthesis. So accessing more light means a plant can increase its photosynthetic rate to make glucose faster. Plants compete for light to be able to produce their food. Being tall and strong means that one plant might have the edge when it comes to accessing light over its neighbours, which means that they can be outcompeted for survival. Additionally, a strong stem allows plants to withstand environmental pressures. For example, strong winds. This can be especially helpful if the plant has heavy branches, fruits or flowers that need to be supported. As if these fruits or flowers are knocked off a plant prematurely and fall onto the ground, they're not so protected from some herbivorous insects, rot, decay and damage. And as we've mentioned, thick and impenetrable cell walls can be very useful in restricting the entry and movement of pathogens into the inner tissues of a plant. Let's review what we've learned about supporting plants by applying our knowledge to a practice question. What will visibly happen to a plant if cell turgidity is not maintained? A. The stem will grow at a faster rate. B. The surface area of the leaves will expand. C. The leaves and the plant will wilt. D. The leaves will turn yellow. Or E. The flowers will drop off. This question is asking us about the effects of low cell turgidity on the plant as a whole. So first, let's explore how turgidity affects individual plant cells. Turgidity is the point at which the plant cell membrane pushes against the cell wall, making the cell swollen and firm, usually because it's full of liquid. This diagram shows us a typical turgid plant cell, which is what they are referred to when they're full of water and have a high turgidity. The vacuole in plant cells stores water molecules and dissolved solutes. When a plant cell is in an environment that has a high water potential, which is represented by these many blue dots showing water molecules outside the plant cell, water will move from outside the cell where there's a high water potential into the cell's vacuole where there's a comparatively lower water potential. The vacuole can then exert turgor pressure onto the cell cytoplasm, which pushes against the cell membrane and against the cell wall, making the cell turgid. This is an example of physiological support in a plant, and when many cells become turgid, the plant will stand upright and rigid. However, this process is temporary, and if the water potential in the extracellular space decreases so much that it's lower than the water potential in the cell's vacuole, the water molecules will move from an area of high water potential in the cell's vacuole to an area of comparatively lower water potential in the extracellular space via osmosis. This means that the vacuole no longer exerts so much turgor pressure upon the cell membrane, so the cell membrane pulls away from the cell wall, resulting in the cell with low turgidity. The plant cells in this condition appear shrunk and wrinkled, and if this happens to many plant cells, then the plant as a whole, especially its leaves, will visibly wilt. 
Therefore, we can deduce that the effects of low cell turgidity on the plant as a whole is that the leaves and the plant will wilt. Now it's time for us to recap some of the key points that we've covered in this video about support in plants. Support in plants can be divided into physiological support or structural support. While physiological support is temporary, structural support is usually permanent. Physiological support refers to plant cells' ability to increase their turgidity via osmosis. Structural support is the deposition of strong compounds like lignin into specific plant cell walls that need extra support or waterproofing. Plant support mechanisms can be advantageous as they help a plant to conserve water, access more sunlight, protect a plant against damage, and even against disease-causing pathogens.